that, that rest caught up to you that you didn't get and you feel a little bit weary and obviously you're down here worshiping but I began to look across the sanctuary, the, the altar area and I see some that are engaged and I see some that are just thinking, man, if I can get through tonight, if I can make it through this evening. And I'm just asking tonight if you can, if you can just pause for a moment. I believe that he deserves more than what we just gave him. I believe that. What I want you to do right now, how many campers have a need? You'd say, I've got a need. Whether it be a, a need in your home, in your family, you need something to change when you leave camp this year. How many can say that? Come on, let, me, let, it, let it be known. Lift your hand high if you have a need. I think the question you might need to ask your need right now is who are you? Yeah, that's good. Great Mountain. Who, who are you to come against my Lord? David walked on a battlefield and he said, I don't have what you think I need to have and I don't have what others might possess, but one thing I know, I come to you with a backing you don't understand. I come to you in the name of the Lord so I wish right now you would go ahead and look at your need and you'd say, you know what? I don't know how it's going to happen. But who are you to stand against the power of the matchless name of Jesus? Who are you, Great Mountain? You've never lost. You've never lost. You've never lost a battle, Lord. Say, who are you? and say, God, I trust you. I believe your word right now. You've never lost and you never will. No, you never will. You're not going to lose my battle, God. Come on, you got to believe. I'm trying to get you to place yourself in an understanding that he's not going to lose the battle, but you've got to let him in the battle. You've got to invite him into the battle. You've got to say, God, I place this in your hands. You never will. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Man, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. You guys going to help me preach tonight? Amen, amen. Oh, Lord, help us, Jesus. Well, you can hurry back to your seats right now, if you will. Thank you for worshiping with us tonight. Thank you for being incredible so far. We're praying for the young girl that, is it Mackenzie, is that right? Mackenzie, Brother Ryan. We're praying for Mackenzie who broke her collarbone today. We're praying that God would touch her. Amen. Man, it's so good to be in Indiana, and it's even better to be in Indiana with my wife and my kids. We're thankful that we get to come back to this great district, and we're thankful for the opportunity. When the phone call came, it wasn't even a question. We were anxious to get back. And we love Indiana. We love it so much that we have a third child named Indy. (laughs) 
We love Indianapolis. We love Indy. We love Indiana. My, as I said, they're not my roots are deep into this district, and I want to give honor to my, my grandfather who's no longer here, but last time I was here, he slipped in and said about, I don't know, midway back on that left side, and I looked up and saw my grandfather sitting there a little bit hunched over because of his age, and his, he was physically tired, and I thought, what an honor to have a heritage like God's blessed me with, but at the same time, I thought, what what a responsibility. You see, young people, you, you get to come into this campground, and it's, it's, it's cool, it's fun. You got a great gym, and you got all this cool stuff. You got great leadership, but don't get carried away in just that being what it is. It's a responsibility now for you to carry this on, to keep it alive, to keep it going. Amen? Amen. I'm thankful for what God's doing, what God's going to do. Amen. I'm going to pre. I'm going to read actually from. I think we'll just go straight to verse um, verse forty in John chapter one, reading in verse forty. If it is the norm for you to stand for the reading of the word, you feel free to do that by all means. I want to invite you to do that. It's always awkward when you don't say that, and you got about three that say, "I'm going to stand," and the rest are like, "What do we do?" definitely all for you standing. I also know you've been standing, but we want to honor the word of the Lord. I do want to say one more time, and I meant to stop a little bit more, but I'm, I'm glad to have my wife here. She's the one in the very, very beautiful pink dress, but the dress is nothing compared to how beautiful she is, and I'm thankful for that. Y'all go ahead and give me a good all. I'm trying to get some brownie points. I'm trying to win over some brownie points right now. That was pretty good. I, I, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I did okay there. I've messed some of those things up, but man, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. Guys, guys, listen to me. That's how it's done, all right? Good job. That's what's up. <laughs> Let me just stop for a moment and tell you real fast. Let me tell you girls something real fast. If they don't know how to hold a hammer, they don't know how to open a door for you, if they don't know how to be a man, then move on. Let me tell you real fast, the first thing you should do is ask them, do you play video games all day? If they say, yeah, I do, you say, I'm out. Ain't interested in that. If they sit around all day long on their phone or their iPad and they sit around at that 14 years old and they got nothing better to do than to get out or to sit inside, if they don't know what it feels like to breathe fresh air, if they don't know what it feels like to sweat on a basketball court, if they don't know what it's like to say yes ma'am and, and yes sir and no ma'am and no sir, they ain't worth it. Is this okay? <clears throat> Let me talk to you guys for a moment. You are being attacked right now. They're trying to get in your mind right now. Not them, the world. I'm going to be serious for a moment. The world's trying to get in your mind right now to let you know that it's wrong to be a man. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. If you've not had a grass stain on some jeans in a while, if you've not spit in the dirt outside in a while, is this okay? Can I just talk about being old-fashioned, masculine, gross at times? Can is it okay? I'm tired. I'm tired of our guys being attacked. And you better make up in your mind right now that I'm going to be strong. I'm going to do the right things. It's not old-fashioned to be right. Make some decisions right now. Is, this okay? is that all right? I hope this is okay. I'm not attacking anybody unless you feel attacked. <laughs> if you feel attacked, you'll get over it after the altar service. <laughs> Man, it feels good. It feels good to be here with you. Let's look at this scripture together. The Bible says, of the two who heard John speak and followed him. Now, here's the thing. You can't get here unless you're following him. It doesn't happen unless you're following. The Bible says, was Andrew Simon Peter's brother? 
Now notice, Andrew never even gets, before Jesus even knew him, Andrew never gets that I'm just Andrew. He's always Simon Peter's brother. It was always that. And so it goes on a little bit farther, and it says in verse 41, it says, he first found his own brother Simon. So, so here's what happens. Simon Peter runs as fast as he can, and he finds his own brother and said to him, we have found the Messiah. Now let me just tell you real fast, there was lots of contemplation about this because they were looking for a Messiah, and the Messiah looked a lot of different ways to a lot of different people. But Andrew had a little bit of notion. He knew without a doubt we found him. And it, and it goes on, it goes a little farther in verse 32, and we'll read this and, and we'll dive into this tonight. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. You're going to be a rock. But notice what happened here. Andrew meets him. And he rushes off and he gets somebody and says, I want to bring you to Jesus. I want to preach to you on this simple topic tonight. And I hope you can help me tonight. I'll do my best not to be long. I have a brother named Mark. I have a brother named Mark. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit that we feel. We thank you for the power that we feel in this house, God. We thank you for the anointing that's already here, Lord, when your word is already anointed. But, God, we pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would do a work. Allow us to have the courage to respond to your word, God. I pray plant this in our hearts. Put this in our minds. Put it in our spirits, God. And we believe you're going to do a work tonight that will change lives. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. Clap your hands real big and let them know one more time we love him. And while you're at it, let this band know how much you appreciate them leading us into the presence of the Lord. We thank them. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. While I'm at it, I want to say good job to those in the back of the house there doing all the work you're doing. You're doing an incredible job. Thank you, uh, each and every one of you, for all your work. Behind the scenes, we appreciate you so much. Amen. I, um, I have two brothers I have a sister, but I'm going to leave her out of this tonight just because she might kill me. But here, here's, here's, can you find me? Which one am I? That's exactly right. I'm styling, man. I brought the red jacket. They're boring, and I'm like, what's up? I came, and I brought the party. I'm the youngest of these three split part guys. I had just actually found some of those plastic scissors, you know what I'm talking about? The ones that are like the kid, the, the, the old-fashioned plastic scissors, you know, I, I, I gave him my, I'd given myself a haircut. My mom came in and found a bunch of hair underneath the couch. And before that, I had hair. I think the problem was I did not want to have the hairdo that they have. So I was trying to find a way to get rid of my hair. And, and obviously, I, I figured it out. But anyways, <laughs> I have two brothers. My, we, we, we grew up in a pastor's home. My dad pastored in a town, still does, by the way, in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. That's a hard word to say. Takes, you have to take classes to learn how to say Arkadelphia. But good job, you're doing it. Good job. Okay, you passed the class. All right, we get it. Good job. Uh, but but uh, leave it just, yeah, thanks. But here's the thing. We grew up in a pastor's home, and so we were exposed to this, to uh, the, you know, ministry and, 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 and God, you know, working in our family just as many of you and just like as many of you that, that didn't grow up in a pastor's home. But, but this picture hangs in my dad's office uh, wall, and and. I got to looking at it one day. You see, my older brother, Rich is his name. He, he, he is, he's the guy that never did anything wrong. Anybody got that sibling, you know what I'm talking about, where like, like you're sick of them? You're like, like, I'm tired of them, man. Like, they never do anything wrong. Come on, like, like always up to nothing but good. And, and if, if you got in trouble as a kid, it's probably because they did something, but they got their act straight in time for you to get in trouble. Thank you. She, like, I, I, I understand. I understand the situation. I call my older brother Rich, I call him Assistant Jesus. He's always just, just got together. He was tall. I ain't got that. He was slim. I ain't got that. He was blonde-headed and blue-eyed. I've got none of it. And, and he, I mean, when I was a kid, we would go to camp, and I would sell dirty socks out of the camper for $5 a piece. I kid you not. 
the, the, the girls from junior high camp would come knock on the trailer, and I would say, I've got some socks. And I would sell his socks, and they would buy them from me. I had a good business going. It was a great business. Like, that's how serious it was. Is my cousin Danny Lytle in the building? Is, there he is right there. You, we both, like Rich drives us both crazy. He's just always good. He's always right. We, we've seen the other side of him, though. We've seen, but he's, he's actually a wonderful human being. I just hate, I can't stand him. But anyways, um, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. But then I've got Mark, and my, my brother Mark is, is the guy that's the outdoorsman, the fisherman. We love to hunt together, but he's, he's the guy that if he's here, he, he, he would, he's got a little bit of a country twang to him. And he'd come in, and he'd probably be like, what's the ruckus about? And he'd, he'd, he'd have a fishing pole in the car, and he'd, he'd uh, find a, a lake somewhere nearby, and he'd take a few pictures in a little bit and have a nice big bass in the picture and say, here, this is what I've been doing right here. And he, he's, he's, he's the guy, though, that wasn't quick to get in front of people. And, and even not long ago, uh, um, it's, been, it's been like 2006, 2007, my older brother, Rich, was going to uh, Canada to preach a camp in New Brunswick at the same exact time. I got an opportunity to go to Liverpool and to London, and I got to preach for a, a couple of weeks there. And in the middle of us both traveling, and I only say this for the point of what I'm trying to tell you about my brother Mark, we were both gone, and my mom, I called my mom, and she said, Mark is a little bit down. I said, why would he be down? She said, he walked into the house and said, well, the black sheep of the family is here. Bothered me. I'm over here getting to preach and getting to see some things, getting to do some things, and finding out the camp for my brothers going great. We're both ministers, but but in the midst of us us being called to preach, Mark here, the middle brother, just didn't have the desire, never felt the nudge, never felt like that was his calling. And 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 yet, in the middle of all of that was going on, we would find ourselves busy in ministry, and and Mark would be on the second row while maybe he or I was preaching youth service, or while. We were going to the local youth rally, and he would ride with me, and he's older than me, but he would he would go with me, and, and I would preach, and we'd get in the car, and, and he was the one that was um, a little bit undiscovered. We'd go to camp, and they would say, do you have another brother? And I'd say, yeah, you know, Mark. They'd say, we don't. We don't know Mark. Even when I came to school at Indiana Bible College, they would say, you've got one brother, right? And I said, no, I've got two. And, and they would say, well, who's the other one? He was the, the quiet, um, uh, somewhat at times possibly timid until you got to know him, brother. And he wasn't called to preach. He was like a disciple that we look at in the Bible, a disciple whose name was Andrew. And Andrew we just read about. And Andrew was, was the evidence of Jesus understanding the importance of roles and personalities. Understanding that, and, and I understand this now, I thank God that not everybody's like me. This place would be a mess. We would have a list a mile along of things we still need to get done. I thank God there's people that have different personalities. I thank God that, there's, that, that I've understood what it is to surround myself by people that are different than me, that, are, that have a different calling, a different personality, that have, can I say this, a different Enneagram. Is that all right? Oh, man. I thank God that, that, that when Jesus began to look, he began to look and say, I don't want a carbon copy. I don't want this. I want different ones. And, and in the midst of all that he was calling and all he was doing, as he began to surround himself by the 12, he reached out and got a hold of Andrew. Because Andrew, uh, um, uh, he had qualities that others did not possess. And in Andrew's life, we find that when, when Andrew comes to Jesus, he meets up with Jesus. He comes in contact with Jesus. And, and when he meets Jesus, the first thing he does is when he, when he meets him, come here real fast. He, he, you got to hurry up. Bubba. And when he meets him, he comes to Jesus and he says, I have known. I, I just want to make sure all the ladies can see you. Turn and smile real fast. I said, what's up? What's up? There you go. There you go. And so, so. So he comes and he meets him. He says, he says, I'm, I'm not the one. I'm going to be with you, but I, I know somebody. 
I, I, I've got a friend. I've got a brother. I've got a contact. I know somebody. And what he does in a hurry is he runs as fast as he can. And he says, you have to meet somebody. I just met the Messiah. I just met Jesus. And I need you to get with Jesus. And so he runs back. And he says, Jesus, I need you. you got to be on this side. This is really important. You should have read that. But I need you. I need you to know him. And so what Andrew does is what every one of us are called to do. Andrew, the Bible says, brought Simon Peter to Jesus. He connects what he sees as values and resources. He connects somebody. to You see, the problem oftentimes is that we say, if I'm not getting him, nobody's getting him. If I don't have the calling, nobody's got the calling. If I don't sing the solo, nobody sings the solo. The struggle is many of us have our eyes this week on the pulpit and not on Jesus. And, and what, what's, what's, what, what Andrew did is he came and he said, I, I, I gotta feel, if I can just get my brother connected to you, there's no telling what's going to happen. He's a little rash. He's a little bit crazy. He wears antlers on a suit lapel, and they're really, really cool, by the way. But he's, he's, he likes, he, not, just so you know, there's none, none of this is meant to be on. I, I really, really love your suit, by the way. I wish I could wear it, but obviously that would be a catastrophe. But, but he, 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 has, he dresses a little bit out there, and, and he's got a cool suit. And he's, 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 he's not as tall as the speaker, but he's really, really sharp. But if I can connect you to him, if I can get you to him, if I can, there's people in your school that you're, you're not called to do anything else but to find a way to say, if I can get you to him, if I can get you to him, if I can get you to him, if I can get you, oh my goodness, if I can get you, if I can get you, oh, I can get you to Jesus, there's no telling what can happen. You see, no, you can be seated, but, 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 but you might be back. I don't know. Be seated just Give him a big hand. Here's, here's the thing about my brother. My brother was the black sheep of the family. My brother named Mark that no one knows. My brother was the one that I would be getting in and, uh, at my dad's church when I was there for a short time. I'd be getting ready to preach, and I'd be in the little office that I had set up. My name was there on the door, and I was, I was the, the, the young preacher, and I had, I had it going on, and I, I was cool or whatever. My brother was outside waiting for Sister Blevins to drive up. Sister Blevins was a tall, sweet lady that would drive up in the sweetest-looking Cadillac. It road like a boat on the road, and she'd pull up, and because we had stairs in front of the church, my brother was waiting on her. He'd take her keys and say, Sister Blevins, I'm going to park your car again. He'd go park her car, walk back up, put her keys in her hand, and wait on Sister Har. Sister Har would come in with the Williams family. She was old and feeble, and she never walked in the church without touching my brother's hand. Why? Because he was always there to help her in the church. On Saturday, Mark would get up and make sure every light bulb was changed. He'd make sure everything was working at the church. He'd make sure the yard looked good. He'd make sure the glass was clean. He, may, he never preached a sermon, but he preached more doing the things he was doing than most young up-and-coming preachers have ever done in their life. Why? Because he understood that God has called me not to preach. Here's my worry. Here's my worry, and I hope, I hope every great minister in this, this, this tabernacle understands what I mean by this. Don't misunderstand, please don't misunderstand me. Don't twist what I'm saying. But we've got enough that have tried to force themselves into a calling to preach. We made at times, and don't miss, please, I, I, I'm walking in sincerity and I'm humbly speaking right now, but we, at times we've made this an idol that you can get here at camps. Someday God's going to call you to preach. What's ever happened to God calling you to be a great, great soul winner while you're a doctor? What's ever happened to God calling you to be a great soul winner while you're on a restaurant? What's ever happened to God calling you to be a great soul winner and a Sunday school teacher while you're in the obscure, quiet darkness where, where no one sees you at church, 
but you fill the roll up. You fill the pews up with person after person. Why? Because you got the understanding. I'm going to get you to Jesus. You see... Andrew had a calling, and I'm, I'm hurrying, but Andrew had a calling. He had, he had a calling because he had qualities. There was something about Andrew that was amazing. Is every time, every time in the Gospels we find a miracle happening, you can, fit, you can usually find Andrew close by. It was Andrew on the day that Jesus got approached by the others, and they said, Jesus, the people are hungry. He took 5,000, not counting women and children, took 5,000 and began to get ready to, to, to he, was, he was speaking to them and they said, Lord, these people are starving. You guys can be seated just for a moment. Lord, these people are starving. And, and as the others were trying to find their way to get front and center, as the others were trying to find the way to make sure that they got in the photo, as the others were staying close to Jesus and, 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 and making sure they were up front, Andrew was looking around before there was even a question. He was looking around and he had already spotted, way before the question was ever posed, a young man, a junior camper who had a little sack lunch with some fish and some bread. And he had already spotted and thought there is going to be a need. And there's going to be something. But what did he do? He didn't say, let's go figure this out together. No, he had an idea that I'm not going to do this on my own. So what did he do? He reached out and he said, hey, stay close to me, young lad. Stay, walk with me. I want you to stay close. He got to know his name. He figured out who he was. He found out what he liked. He found out where he was from. He said, where's your mom and daddy? Let me talk. I'm going to borrow him in a moment because they don't know it yet, but he's about to become a superstar. It was never about Andrew. Andrew never stepped up and said, hey, it was me. But when the question came and everybody was saying, what will we do? Andrew said, I've already got a solution. I found somebody and your church is looking for the same thing. If you need a drummer, go find a drummer. If you need a musician in your church, go get a musician and win them to the Lord. My brother at camp last week, very few know who he is to this day. He was working long hours on his, on his job, but he would come in on the evenings in Arkansas. And when they found out he was there, they knew that they saw the truck, and he's an electrician. He's turned down so many opportunities in his, in his job because he likes the life. The reason why, truly, if he told you, is because he's flexible. He doesn't miss church. i tell you right now, he pays his tithes. He gives some missions. He supports missionaries. He does all that he needs to do. You don't have to question one thing about him. He loves to deer hunt. He'd give anything to have one. And my dad would say, you get one Sunday off. He would shout for joy, but that doesn't happen. So he doesn't do it. <laughs> we got a picture of my brother here. This is last week when, when we were getting ready for recreation. Is this okay tonight? Is this all right? <laughs> last week we were getting ready for recreation. And, and, the, and the ball lights the night before, they kept popping off and and no one knew what was going on. We, 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 we do recreation in the evenings there. Sorry about that. But anyways, it's really, really fun. Y'all should try some time. But um, um, sorry. Why, why would I say that? Sorry about that. Um, but but uh, isn't this weather great? Let's change the subject. <laughs> but we called Energy, and Energy said, my brother actually went out to change two, two uh, breakers. In the, in the box back there that controls the lights, somebody put them in, and they were way too small. And he went out to change them, and he had just got enough work. He was tired, and, and he, he goes out to change them, and he hears a wire sizzling. He said it sounded like bacon, and he called uh, Energy, and he said, hey, I've got a problem out there. And, 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 and they said, get all the kids away, because the problem was is that, that wire, if it kept on going, was about to turn the whole pavilion into a, 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 a place where you could walk, touch it, and get electrocuted. He, they said, get everyone away. So we had to shut down recreation, get everybody out. And he called me, and he said, hey, you might want to come back here and I went back to check on it with him and, and we had to put up some tape and get everything ready and everybody was all nervous about it and the energy came out and the energy guy was there and the guy was taking his time, he gets paid by the hour he was taking a sweet precious little time and kids were down to play ball and, and, and we were we had snow cones for him, we're trying to bribe him, give him the good, we have good snow cones, we put ice cream in them, we call them stuffed snow cones 
That's what built this temple I've got. And so these things are really, really good. And so, so we, 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 we were giving this guy snow cones, and, and he had worked for us the week before too. But my brother's out there, and notice what's happening. And I appreciate my man. He was a really, Antonio was his name, really good guy. But he said, I'm going to step back. He said, you clearly know what you're doing. And Mark was back there, and no one was walking by saying, good job, Mark. Guess what? He never said, why doesn't someone come bring me a snow cone? Why is nobody coming and telling me good job? He never said it. He was smiling the whole time. I, I thought this was funny because I couldn't find a picture with him not smiling. He was glad to do it. He was literally there. If that would have been another 10 or 15 minutes, the guy from Energy said, we would have had a fire on our hands and had a bad situation. But my brother named Mark walked up and found it and dealt with it. But here's what I want you to see. There's another picture. There's another picture. And so here he is, even two hours later, fixing the problem. And I thought, this just seems right. I'd already told my wife, I feel to come to this uh, sanctuary this week and preach this message. But I sat there and watched. This is typical. And I've come to let you know, I've come to tell somebody here tonight that if you don't feel a call to the uh, to preaching ministry, if you don't feel a call to the platform, you're okay. You don't have to vacate your seat. You don't have to walk out of the sanctuary. You don't have to leave camp. You are not less valuable than anybody else. Actually, we need more Andrews. We need more saying, I'm going to get you to Jesus. I'm going to find a way to connect you in Jesus. I'm going to find a way. I'm not going to get caught up in what I've got going on. I'm not going to get caught up in what my agenda is. The difference between the Simon spirit at times and the Andrew spirit is Simon was rash and desired a little bit of that praise that Andrew was, was quick to point his fingers at Jesus and was okay without the praise. He was okay not taking the shot if he didn't need to. He was okay not stepping out in front if he didn't need to. He got his gratification from God getting all, not just some, of the glory. The reason why I'm here tonight, the reason why I'm here tonight speaking this, because I fear over the years, as I've sat in camp service after camp service, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm, again, one more time begging. This is the last time I'll do this, but I'm begging you not to misunderstand me because we need church planners and we need pastors and we need missionaries and we need preachers. But I've worried, I've worried, I've worried that kids have walked out because they didn't feel that call. And they have drawn away from what God is doing. And it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to receive a call to do something else. It's okay. I watched week after week. As I would stand in the pulpit in my home church. Even times I'd come home. I'd see my brother on a Sunday night exhausted and tired. He puts in 60 or so hours a week at times. He's an incredible father. I'll drive by sometimes on a, on a, on a Sunday afternoon or Saturday, and he's out making sure. I'm, 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 not, I'm not trying to stretch it. It is what it is. He's taking care of things. He's doing his best. And, 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 I, and I wish I could say never, but I rarely ever hear him complain. But I would watch as I would preach in the pulpit a message to that church, and I would see him exhausted and tired. But I would watch him as he would clap, and he would get behind the preaching of the word. And I would watch as he'd get behind. And, and, and so much, when I left for Indiana, Bible college, I was the only drummer we had, and I felt so guilty, I felt so bad. When I left to come to school, I was our only drummer. We had lost one to the military, and we had lost, and I had I'd taken a step away to come to school, and I would call my mom and my, my dad, and my mom would say, babe, don't worry about it. We're glad you're there. You need to be there, and I felt so guilty, and then I call about a month and a half, two months later, and I said, mom, are, have you found anybody? Is there, she said, well, Mark, 
has learned how to play the drums. You see what Mark did? Mark said, if we don't have a drummer, I'll be the drummer. And he'd go up extra time in the week, and he'd figure it out. And I called him, and I said, I heard you're playing the drums. He said, it's terrible right now, but I'm going to get there, and I'm going to figure. You see, he had a spirit. If it, if it needs to get done, I'm going to do it. If somebody has to do it, I'm not waiting for somebody else. I'm going to go get it done. And, and too, many, too many of us say, no, surely there's somebody else that can do it. Surely there's someone who's not the PK that can do it. Surely there's somebody that doesn't have talent that can pick up the trash. Surely we can find somebody else. Simon Peter struggled with this himself. John 15, and I believe it's verse 21 is where we start this conversation. You don't have to go there, but Jesus standing there with his disciples, and they had dined together, and Jesus looks at Simon Peter, and he noticed the problem in Simon Peter, and he says to him, do you love me more than these? And the question would be, what are these? What are, what are the, what are, what are, what are the, what's the competition here? What's the issue here? What's the struggle? Why, why is he asking the question, do you love me more than these? And what Jesus asked, Simon Peter was quick to uh, uh, reply, and he says, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he asked quick, again, he says, do you love me, Simon Peter, more than these? And he says, yea, Lord, like, like, do, do you not hear me. Yes, I love you. And the Lord asked a third time, do you love me more than these? And each time when he asked the question, at the end of it, he would say, then feed my lambs, which is a euphemism for saying, take care of my people. If you love me, you'll do as I do. If you'll love me, you'll minister as I do. But here, just a minute now, listen to me. Listen to me now. He said, do you love me? And he gets a hold of him and he deals with him and he says, if you love me, then follow thou me. And the first thing the Bible says, the first thing he does, the scripture says, then Peter turning about. Jesus says, follow me. And Simon Peter says, yeah, I'm going to follow you. Just give me a moment. Just give me a second. And he looks and finds the disciple whom Jesus loved in the text. We don't find where they gave themselves, they, where they, they wrote their own name in the Gospels. They would write a title for themselves. They would give themselves some title. So John said, I'm going to hook myself up. And I'm going to be the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John is recording quickly here. He's writing down this, this observation of what's happening between Simon Peter and Jesus. And he sees there's a bit of an issue. And Simon sees his competition writing this down and he can't take it. He can't stand it. He's so concerned that somebody's going to get in on his journey and he doesn't like it. So he says, what about this? What about him, Lord? The Lord's saying, please just follow me. And he said, I know, but before we go anywhere, before you walk me into my destiny, before you do what you want to do in my life, before, before I go on this journey with you, what about this one. You see what Jesus was asking Simon Peter was, do you love me more than your competition? Do you love me more than those that are around you? Because where your eyes are is where your heart is. And too many times we serve looking to see who's noticing. We worship to make sure that everybody sees us with our perfect Pentecostal praise. And the difference was that Andrew said, I don't care if anybody else notices, but I want to serve you, God. I want to serve you, and I want to bring people to you. John, John. What's amazing, can you get me real fast, Acts 2.38, can you get that scripture up for me? Acts 2.38, you can stand to your feet tonight. I, 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 I'm just going to, I really, really feel like the Lord wants to speak to somebody who's struggling. It might be the only one, I don't know, but I feel like the Lord wants to speak to somebody tonight. But this is our, this is our, this is our verse. Everybody knows the verse, right? This is our verse. This is it for us. We, let me just help you understand though real fast. Acts 2.38 was the response to the message, not the message. They said, well, he came and he preached Jesus and him crucified. And they said, how do we get him? And Simon Peter gets back up and goes back to the pulpit. And he said, well, here's the deal. you got to repent me, baptize every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for your sins. 
It was the response to the questions that came. But here we go. I want you to look at this with me. And I'm going to add a little bit myself here because this is important that you get this. Everybody look at me right now just for a moment here. Everybody say, then Peter. Let me add something for you. The one that Simon, the one that Andrew brought to Jesus. Yeah, here, here, I want you to hear me now. Let me, let, me, let me talk to you for a moment. Andrew didn't peek up while they were writing and say, hey, make sure you get me on that right there. Come on, man. Make sure you get me. Listen, I don't have much, but if you can just put my, if you can just put in there a little comma, the one that, if you can just get it for me real fast. And, and, my name is A-N-D-R-E-W. If you, yeah, d- 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 let me write it real fast. Let me get, let me, let me get that pen. Let me get that. He didn't do that. We don't even read it that way. We don't say then Peter, the one that Andrew ran as fast as he could, and said, if you can just get with Jesus. We just get the product. And oftentimes the product of the ministry that's behind the scenes doesn't get man's praise. But it gets God's. It gets God's. I believe, I believe in the back of that room that day when Simon Peter got up and began to preach Jesus and him crucified. I believe this because I've felt this before. I've felt this. I'm, I, I felt a little bit of this experience because my brother, who never gets credit, who never gets a pat on the back, who, who no one really knows, and I've, I've been in a camp like this where he's been back towards the back, and, and I've, I've preached before, and I've looked back at times, and he's stood clapping his hands, and he said, that's it. The black sheep of my family, I've been there at times. When I came and I preached an anniversary service for my dad on Sunday morning, and my brother, Rich, did on Sunday night, my my middle brother never got to the pulpit that day. He never got to take a text that day, but he also never complained that day. He sat somewhere in the middle by his kids, paid his tithes, made sure things were good, made sure I had water, but he clapped. But I believe, just a moment here, listen, listen just for a moment, I believe on this day, the Bible would give us understanding if we could read deep into this. And then Peter said unto them, repent and let every one of them be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ, through remission of sins, I believe we could look into this text and we could peek into this room you'd find Andrew in the back with tears running down his face saying I knew if I could get you to Jesus I just knew if I could find a way to get you connected to him I didn't have to worry about how and I didn't have to get you to that pulpit but I just knew if I would do what God called me to do and I would get somebody connected to him that lives would be changed. And too often we try to figure out how to change the lives. And all you've got to do is bring people to Jesus. I think, listen to me now, you, you can hang on to the clap in just a moment. As I walked through this campground today, I saw so many for great people, great ministers, pastors, and great workers all through this campground working. Brother Peterson, they'll never get the hand clap that you'll get this weekend, and they're okay with it. You deserve it, to be honest with you. You deserve it. What a great leader you have. What great leadership you have. The best of the best, the best of the best. No one tonight is going to say, can I get some nachos? And when they take that spoon, they're going to put the nachos out there. And no one tonight is going to say, everybody clap for the nacho person. There you go. Maybe we are. On Sunday, there's going to be somebody that gets a vacuum out early in the morning before you get there. And none of us are going to see them and say, man, what a great job you're doing. And they're okay with that. And I'm calling tonight to you to ask you, are you okay with the same? 
because you've always got to go through an Andrew ministry to get to Jesus. Hear me right now. Hear me right now. I want you to hear me, and I'm closing. You always have to go through an Andrew ministry to get to Jesus. Simon was somewhere off in the distance, and Andrew was following Jesus. And the call tonight is for you to do the same thing. Are you willing to follow? Because that's where you got to be tonight. I'm going to finish with this. It's okay. It's okay. If you never stand in a pulpit and preach a message, just bring people to Jesus. It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. It's okay. Tonight, I'm asking if there's anybody in the room. You've dealt with this a little bit. You've wondered about this. I'm asking you to come right now. And I want you to let the Lord speak to you right now and, and place something in your heart. It's all right if you do feel that calling. I don't want you to misunderstand this tonight. But if you've wrestled with it, you felt devalued, you felt a little bit of a struggle in your spirit, I want to tell you right now, I want you to come and say, Lord, I give myself fully to your work. That's right. I want you to just open your heart to him. We're just going to take a moment right now. We're going to take a moment right now. Just for a moment, just one second. I'm sorry, guys, just a moment. I want everybody to come up real fast. Just come up real quick. Come on, come on, just keep, keep playing. We're going to sing in just a moment. But young men, young ladies, I want you to lift your hands high to him. And I want you to tell the Lord whatever it is you call of me. Whatever it is you want of me. Whatever it is you desire of me, God. I want to stop. I don't want to be short of it. I don't want to miss it. So, God, I'm asking you right now to let your anointing rest on me. Let your anointing rest on what you've called me to do. Let your anointing rest on what you've asked me to do. Uh, come on, would you open your mouth to him right now? And right now, just tell him, Lord, I give, I give my weaknesses to you. I give my struggles to you, God. I give, I give everything to you, God. Come on, let's make this a prayer right now. Yes, Jesus. Come on, now talk to him. Come on, talk to him right now. Come on, someone that just doesn't know if you have it. Yes, you do. You do have it. Someone that's wrestling, wondering if you've got an anointing. Yes, you do. You do have an anointing on your life. I give myself. I give myself away. I give myself away. So
encourage each other right now. Let them know that God has a call on their life. Jesus' name. Jesus, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you. 